chose one verse from the Bible of Tom. This is from the third chapter of the sixth canto. And this is Yamaraj instructs his messengers. And this is text number 24. Now I'll just read the Sanskrit. Tomorrow we'll officially begin the weekend ceremony in glorification of Krishna's holy name. But to set the mood a little bit, we have chosen some, I think some nice verses from the Bhagavatam that helps us go deeper. This is spoken by Yamaraj. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Eta Vatala Magrahina Arnaya Pumsam Sankirtanam Bhagavato Guna Karma Namam Vikrusha Putra Magavam Yara Jaume Lopi Narayan Neti Megamanam Iyaya Muktim Translation Therefore, it should be understood that one is easily relieved from all sinful reactions by chanting the holy name of the Lord and chanting of his qualities and activities. This is the only process recommended for relief from sinful reactions. Even if one chants the holy name of the Lord with improper pronunciation, one will achieve relief from material bondage if he chants without offenses. Ajamiyo, for example, was extremely sinful, but while dying he merely chanted the holy name, and although calling his son, he achieved complete liberation because he remembered the name Narayan. Prila Srila Prabhupada's purport is quite lengthy, so we'll speak a little bit and also read a little. Purport. In the assembly of Raghunath Das Goswami's father, Haridas Thakur confirmed that simply by chanting the holy name of the Lord, one is liberated, even if he does not chant completely inoffensively. Smarta Brahmanas and Mayavadis, of course we might add people in general, do not believe one can achieve liberation in this way. But the truth of Haridas Thakur's statement is supported by many quotations from the Srimad Bhagavatam. In his commentary on this verse, for example, Sri Swami gives the following quotations. If one always chants the holy name of the Lord with great devotion in the evening and in the morning, one becomes free from all material miseries. Another quote, quotation confirms that one can achieve liberation if one hears the holy name constantly, every day with great respects. Anudinam idam adarena srinvam. Another, another quotation says, Svardam kirtanam dhyanam haram abhuta karmanaha janma karma gunanam cha tarartha one should always chant and hear about the extraordinarily wonderful activities of the Lord. One should meditate on these activities and one should endeavor to please the Lord. That's from Srimad Bhagavatam 11.325. Sri Haraswami also quotes from the Paramas, Papa Nishayam Chabavati Smadatam Tamahar Nisham. One can become free from all sinful reactions simply by remembering the lotus feet of the Lord day and night. Tasmat Sankirtanam Vishnur Jagam Mangalam Ahamsam Mahatam Apikauravya Vidya Kantika Nishkritam 
All these quotations prove that one who constantly engages in chanting and hearing the holy name, activities, forms, and qualities of the Lord is liberated. As stated wonderfully in this verse, etavalam agaham niranayam pumsam, simply by uttering the holy name of the Lord, one is free from all sinful activities. And there is a verse in the 12th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Kalir Dosha Nidi Rajan Asti Eko Mahagun Kirtana Eva Krishna Sya Mukta Sangam Param Bajet. This verse is a summation of everything that's been said before especially in the 12th canto. The 12th canto describes the, the characteristics of this particular age. And what are those characteristics? One misery, one difficulty, one calamity after another. This age is saturated with hardships, difficulties, materially, and it impinges even on those who uh, practice spiritual life. Even in spiritual circles, these material miseries seem to enter and cause difficulties. So it is everywhere. It's just like the air. There's no place that the air is not. So similarly in this age, you can expect that this age is full of difficulties. Personal, familial, social, communal, national, international, interplanetary, <laughs> interuniversal. <laughs> so it is just one difficulty out of another. So this verse, Kaler Dosha Nidi, when you think of an ocean, you think of something vast, something unlimited, something very deep, something that no one can measure or even understand. So this verse is Kaler Dosha Nidi. Nidi means ocean and Dosha means faults. In this age there is an ocean of faults. It's just the way it is. We don't really have to take time to list these things because we don't have time. Not because of the limitation of the class, but because it's just you can't extend. You can't really go through what is the calamities that are being and it's only going to increase. That's the nature of the situation. So you can expect that. You can expect. Don't be surprised when it happens. It's just the way it is. One calamity after another. This is a very hard age. It's a difficult age. People are inclined to material life, sense gratification, and personal self-interest, that's all. And if people become a little bit self-extended in their interest to others, it has a personal motivation also. This is the age. This is the way it is. You can't complain. It's like complaining, why is the winter cold? Because it's the winter. Why is this age full of faults? Because it's Kali Yuga. It's just the way it is. It'll only increase. But then, Kalir Dosha Nidi, Asti, Echo. Echo means one. Asti, there is one. What is that? Maha Gunaha. Maha means great and Guna means benediction. This benediction is not small because it can destroy and dissipate all of the difficulties of this age. It's like when something is completely dark and there's no sign of light anywhere and you cannot see anything. There's no glimmer of light anywhere in the darkness. You completely, you feel completely lost. You feel like there is a, a sense of fear that automatically comes with complete darkness. But if some bright light comes, all of a sudden everything becomes clear. Everything is seen nicely. Yeah. No, the darkness is gone. So that bright light is Krishna's holy name. Goloka Premadana Harinam Sankirtan. So this, and then what is the result? Asti Eko Mahagun. What is that Mahagun? That's being Kirtana Krishna. Krishna Kirtan. 
So one should see that to dissipate all the problems in this age and to purify the heart of all material desires and to reach the lotus feet of the Lord in devotion, one should be, one should develop an attachment for chanting. <clears throat> chanting not a ritual, chanting not a requirement, but chanting as a means for happiness, for enthusiasm, for purification. You made it, thank you. <laughs> so, when we think <clears throat> of chanting the holy names of the Lord, sometimes we just push it as part of whatever else we're doing. Oh, it's time for kirtan, it's time for java. But this verse in Prabhupada says, one should always chant here, constantly. Why is it necessary? Because of the nature of this age. It's so difficult. Therefore, one should always constantly bring in the light of Krishna's mercy through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. Every age, there's something that Krishna has empowered in order to purify people in that age. He descends personally as the Yuga avatar, but he also enunciates the Yuga Dharma. In every age, there's a Yuga Avatar and a Yuga Dharma. Dharma means the religion of the age. So in this particular age, what is it? Harir Nama, Harir Nama, Harir Nama, Eva Kevamo, Kalon Nasti Eva, Nasti Eva, Nasti Eva, Gatir Anyata. Why do we do deity worship? Why do we read the scriptures? Why do we um, associate with devotees in different for different services. Why do we all do this? To keep our consciousness clean and pure. This is necessary in order for us to actually chant the holy names of the Lord. The chanting of the holy names of the Lord goes through stages. There is the offensive stage, there is the clearing stage, and there is the pure stage. In Sanskrit it's called Nama Parad, Nama Bas, and Sudanam. Sudanam is the pure name. When the pure name descends, then the whole place becomes the spiritual world. There's nothing material left. It's all purified from the holy name. But the word aparad <clears throat> is a very unpleasant word. It's a very unhappy word. The word, if you study the word, you'll find the word radha is in there, R-A-D-H-A. Hey, but before Radha is Appa, that which is not Radharani, or that which is not Bhakti. So if you see, we always see, we see Radharani, she's standing next to Krishna, and she has her hand like this. Right? So what does this mean? Blessings and one other meaning. Stop. <laughs> Don't go any farther. <laughs> You're not in the right consciousness. <laughs> you can't you can't come here. <laughs> so she's giving blessings to those who are in the right consciousness and stopping those who are in the wrong consciousness. So that wrong consciousness is Aparat <laughs> against Radharani. And what is that wrong consciousness? Of course, we go through what is against Radha, and there they are the offenses. So one should carefully, with great attention, understand what the offenses are and avoid them as if you would avoid a person who has the plague. <laughs> In other words, you get as far away as you can from these things. Why? Because they contaminate our bhakti and they block our progress in devotional service. So one has to be very free, careful to free ourselves from these things. But back to the glories of the holy name. So in this age we read verse after verse, statement after statement, glorification after glorification, principle after principle of how powerful Chan Krishna's holy name 
and says once, just once, not one mantra, one name. One name chanted purely. One cannot estimate enough, one cannot commit enough sinful activities that the holy name of one that's once chanted cannot free one. That's how powerful Krishna's name is. Krishna's name is Krishna. Nama Chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purna Sudo Nitya Mukta Abhinna Tvam Nami Nami No. Abhinna, Abhinna means different, Abhinna means no difference. This verse illustrates that the name is not, has nothing to do with anything material. It's made up of five letters of the alphabet, K-R-S-N-A. But those who see Krishna's name as simply another chanting of the mantras from the Vedas, or chant is just a very nice way to do different types of puja. It's a nice, uh, it's nice, but they don't see the absolute nature of Krishna's name. Simply are approaching the name in a material way. And, so, and therefore, Krishna says, if you approach me with love, I reciprocate accordingly. If you approach me in a materialistic way, you see me that way. Whatever you see put in front of the mirror, it reflects the object in the same way. And so, when we chant Krishna's holy name, or we hear the sound of Krishna's holy name, we should know that's Krishna coming in sound. Krishna coming and so it's that powerful and therefore there's one verse from the Brihad Naradiya Purana Hare Nama Hare Nama Hare Nama Eva Kevala Kalon Nasti Eva Nasti Eva Nasti Eva Gatir Anyata I think it was quoted here in the previous verse in other words this verse is making a very powerful statement <coughs> No other way, no other way, no other way. Now, why is the verse structured in such a way as it, rep it repeats thrice the name and no other way? Because according to Vedic literature and meaning within the literature, if you say something once, one can challenge that and bring in other arguments. If you say something twice, that reduces that tendency. And if you say something three times, that's an absolute principle. There's no argument. It's everything is as it is. So therefore, that verse is making a point. Thrice means there is no other way. There is no other way. There is no other Not by karma. Not by jnana. Not by yoga. Not by dharma. Not by, you know, chat, not, there is no other way. In this age, to actually reach purification of the heart and fulfill all of one's desires, then chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself spoke this verse just to make the point when the Supreme Personality of Godhead wants to establish something in a strong way he speaks it or he performs it in such a way that people understand that because he has done it there is it's an absolute principle now the Vedas are vast and there are many scholars of the Vedas and there are many different types of scholars of different sections of the Vedas. There is the Sama Veda, there is the Yajur Veda, there is the Atharva Veda, there is the Rig Veda, there is the Mahabharata, there are the Puranas, the Itihastas, the, there is the uh, Ramayan, there is the Upanishads. So the Vedas, are divided into two sections, Shruti and Smriti. Shruti is the actual Vedas, 
which makes up the four Vedas plus the Upanishads. And the corollaries of that are the Dharma Shastras and the supporting factors of the Itihastras and the Puranas. But Srimad Bhagavatam is, is, is Smriti. And, and so is Bhagavad Gita, Smriti. It's a commentary on the Vedas which brings out the essence of the Vedas because no one can understand the Vedas in this age. It's not possible. So Lord Brahma makes a point. He says, Iti soda sakam namna kali kama sanasana nata padate opayo sarva vedashu drishyate. He says, after searching through all Vedic knowledge, one cannot find a more sublime process for self-realization in this age, he makes the point, Kali Yuga, in this age, Kaleya Doshani, then chanting of these 16 names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Sometimes Vedic scholars will challenge, where in the, where in the Vedas is the Hamaha Mantra mentioned? This is it. This is Kali Santara Upanishads. And the Upanishads are the Shruti, the, sh the Shruti parts of the Vedas, which are the original Vedas. And this is spoken by Sri Brahmaji himself. Just to illustrate that out of all Vedic knowledge, and there's so many things, there's rituals, there's pujas, there's homeless, there's principles of giving and charity, there is mantra chanting, there are various types of homas, austerities, rules, regulations, restrictions. There are very types of forms of worship, unlimited types of worship. Types of worship in different sectors of society by different people for different purposes. The Vedas are so vast. But then, you have to no one can figure it out. Therefore, the Acharyas tell us that the essence of the Vedas is to glorify the Lord in devotion to the Lord. And in the essence of that glorification, as it says here by Dhyamaraj, devotional service beginning with the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is the ultimate religious principle for the living entities in, the, in human society. Who is Yamaraj? He's a Mahajan. He's the Lord of Death, but he's been empowered to speak transcendental knowledge. His, he has his own sampradaya, not a sampradaya, he has his own following. He is authorized to teach religious principles. And he is speaking these things to his followers, that the essence of everything in the Vedas is bhakti. And the essence of everything of bhakti is Hare Krishna. So when we get right down to the essence, I mean, we want, I mean, if, if there's some scholars that will like challenge the challenges, all right, study the Vedas, couple with different conclusions and understandings. But then again, you have to know what are those statements that, sur that surmise and what we say, distill the essence of the Vedas. Otherwise, you can read the Vedas and you go, you can come out completely confused. What are they saying? This is recommended, that's recommended, this is recommended, this is recommended, that's recommended, do this. So many, many, many rules and regulations. That's why one of the offenses to the Holy Name, the eighth offense, is to somehow consider all these other rules, regulations, rituals, pujas, and they call them satkarmas, all these things, if people think that any of these or any one of them is equal to the chanting of the Holy Names of the Lord, that's an offense. Mm -hmm. The Holy Name is superior to everything. In this age, and the thing is, it's, it's so easy. It's so easy. That's why Vedic scholars and others who really try to understand more deeper what is the truth of, of spiritual life challenge the devotees. 
And here it says this one verse. This is spoken by Yamaraj himself. He says, bewildered, because the, they are bewildered by the illusionary energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yagyavalti, Jamini, and other compilers of religious scriptures cannot know the secret. These are great personalities. Confidential religious systems, I'm sorry, cannot know the secret. Confidential religious Swiss systems of the 12 Mahajas. They cannot understand the transcendental value of performing devotional service or chanting Hare Krishna mantra. Because their minds are attracted to the ritualistic sermons mentioned in the Vedas, especially Yajna, Veda, Samaveda, Rig Veda, their intelligence has become dulled. <laughs> Great scholars, right? Thus, they are busy collecting the ingredients for ritualistic ceremonies that yield only temporary benefits, such as elevation for material happiness. They cannot be attracted to the Sankirtan movement. Instead, they are interested in Dharma, Karma, Moksha, and Artha, Artha, Dharma, Dharma, Artha, Karma, Moksha. We have been fortunate. We haven't gone through all that. And Prabhupada has come and said, Chant Hare Krishna. Well, we take it, yeah. But we don't even know what we've been given. <laughs> Mahaprabhu has come with this jewel. And he's, he's just handing it to everyone here. Here's the means for happiness in this age, elevation to the, to the spiritual world, and perfection of all of one's desires. One can fulfill all one's desires through becoming self-realized. So this is, um, this is what we've been given. But then, in order to approach the Holy Name, one has to purify their consciousness. Chanting of the Holy Name purifies the consciousness. But we have to perform other activities which are corollary in order to keep our consciousness from going down. And that's why, that's why we worship the deity nicely. Seeing the deity is non different from the Lord, Archi Vishnu Siladi Guru no Ruchi. The deity and the Lord are non different, as the name and the Lord is non different. The deity and the Lord is non different. Srimad Bhagavatam is the incarnation of Krishna in sound, transcendental sound knowledge. This knowledge is Krishna in the form of literary incarnation to give us philosophical and spiritual guidance towards the Absolute Principle. And what is the last verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam? It's posted up on one of these green signs. I think it's the one on the very end. Somebody can read that one? It says, uh, 12th Canto, 13th chapter, verse number 23. It's there. Yeah, read it. I can't see it here. Somebody read it. Nice and loud. After going through the entire Bhagavatam, glorification of Krishna and his different incarnations in Krishna in Sri Vrindavan and summarizing all transcendental knowledge in a very sutra type form, Srimad Bhagavatam ends with this. Congregational chanting of the holy name is the essence of our reading. So we come right back in full circle. <laughs> we start with the holy name. But we end with the Holy Name. <laughs> so this is it. But we need to purify our consciousness. That's why Srila Prabhupada mentions here in one verse, he says, I just, if I can find it here, it's in this same section. Mm -hmm. It's a, Okay, I think I got, found it. He says, especially in this age of Kali, Sankirtan alone is sufficient. If the members of our temple in different parts of the world can t simply continue Sankirtan before the deity, especially before Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they will remain perfect. He doesn't say become perfect, he says remain perfect. There is no need for any other performance. 
Nevertheless, to keep oneself clean in habits and mind, deity worship and other regulative principles are required. Srila Jiva Goswami says that although Sankirtan is sufficient for the perfection of life, the archana or worship of the deity in the temple must continue in order for the devotees to stay clean and pure. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur would therefore recommend that one follow, the, follow both processes simultaneously, which is called Pancharatra Giviti and Bhagavad Dharma. We strictly follow the principles of performing deity worship and Sankirtan along parallel. This we should continue. So there is the supporting factor. But they, we have to understand it's all about becoming purified so we can chant the holy names of the Lord. Because everything is there in Krishna's holy name. Okay. So there are so many verses throughout the scriptures to illustrate how glorious the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. Shiva Sanatana Goswami has said something very wonderful. He says, All glories, all glories, all glories to the blissful holy name of Sri Krishna, which causes the devotees to give up all other conventional religious duties, meditation, worship. When somehow or other uttered even once by a living entity, the holy name awards him liberation. The holy name of Krishna is the highest nectar, is my very life and my only treasure. Amen. And Rupa Goswami has composed Namastakam, and there are Shukshastakam prayers. It's all in glorification of Krishna's holy name. So we'll be trying to understand how we can purify our consciousness and avoid those things which take away our enthusiasm for chanting and at the same time open the door to more and more deeper forms of meditation on the holy names of the Lord. Sometimes people say, do you guys do meditation? We say, yes, it's called japa meditation. Or what we say, nam meditation, meditation on Krishna's holy name. So the scriptures actually conclude that one should chant Satatam, Kirtam, Teyal, Telmam. One should chant 24 hours a day. But it's not possible unless we actually purify our consciousness and gradually practice the mood of chanting more and more like that. But Mahaprabhu is so kind that by worshipping Mahaprabhu, hearing about his, his performances of Sankirtan, because all his pastimes are always all centered around chanting the holy names of the Lord. When Sri Nityananda Prabhu was here, he performed Sankirtan in such a way that it was never performed before. When he was with Lord Chaitanya in Jagannath Puri, and Lord Chaitanya said, you stay in Bengal and you preach, I'm going to try to spread the glories of the holy name here in Lord Jagannath's abode. Because there were so many Mayavadis and uh, smart and Brahmins and other ritualistic worshippers. The Lord wanted to purge all that and bring people to the, to the proper consciousness. So he said to Nityananda, you preached there, but Nityananda was feeling so much separation from Mahaprabhu, he couldn't not be away, he couldn't he could stay away from Mahaprabhu's association. So one day he came along with the devotees when they were performing the Ratha Yatra. And, of course, Mahaprabhu was so happy to see Lord Nityananda, and he was a famous. And so they were together, sharing their love to each other and spreading the holy name. But at one point, Lord Chaitanya said, you're here. What about Beng What's, what about Navadweep? Go to Navadweep and take your devotees and glorify the Lord's name there. People are needing there. So Lord Nityananda, with a heavy heart, not wanting to feel, not wanting to disobey the Lord, but of course wanted feeling separation, he took the Lord's instruction on his head, gathered his gopals, and decided to go to Navadweep. But how did they go? They did it with Kirtan. 
and they were chanting and dancing, chanting and dancing, and they got lost. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Not materially, they just didn't know which direction to go in because they were so absorbed in kirtan. And then they had to ask people, which way is it to, 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 to Navadweep? Oh, hi, hi, six miles that way, you have to catch the road. Go that way, go that way. And so they turned, changed directions, got on the road, started to begin kirtan again. They were chanting and dancing and chanting and dancing. And Lord Nityananda was, imagine dancing and chanting with Lord Nityananda. Don't know, you can't imagine. It's just so beautiful. And he's Balaram. And so he, after some time again, they realized we don't know where we are. We don't know which way we're supposed to go. <laughs> and then they asked again. Someone said, oh, hi, 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 20 miles that way. Catch the road along the Ganga. Follow the Ganga and then you'll reach. So they did. Finally, they reached the outskirts of Namadvipa, the house of Raghava Pandit. And they had kirtan. Raghava Pandit came out along with his sister, Damianti. And they were so happy, Raghava Pandit offered Lord Nityananda a garland. But Lord Nityananda, you know, you never know what he's going to do. Just never. He said, make me a garland of kadamba flowers. He wanted kadamba flowers. You ever, you ever seen a kadamba flower? Yeah? No? Oh, it's the most beautiful flower in the world you've seen, right? It's an orange ball. It's got all these little shoots. They're so packed together, it just looks like one piece. And it's a beautiful, it's either yellow, it's, no, it's like this orange color here, or it's like <coughs> bright yellow. So beautiful. If you get a Katamba flower, you don't want to give it away. <laughs> and it's very fragrant. So, Raghava Pandit said, Nitai, this, this is not the season for Gadamba flowers. And Nityananda said, go in your backyard and see what you can find. So he went, and on the lime tree, he found Gadamba flowers. <laughs> and of course, Nityananda's mystic power. He, after getting over his shock, he picked all the flowers and made a beautiful garland, and he gave it to Lord Nityananda. And then someone was saying, we smell Damanaka flowers. Now, Damanaka flowers grow only in the area of Jagannath Puri. And who wears Damanaka garlands? Mahaprabhu. He would only take Damanaka flowers. So everyone was thinking, Mahaprabhu must be here somewhere. But Lord Nityananda could see, because it says, wherever Lord Nityananda is performing kirtan, Mahaprabhu is personally present. So he was in his unmanifested form dancing, along with Lord Nityananda and Kirtan, but no one could, only one or two of the most <laughs> elevated of all the Vaishnavas could actually see Lord Chaitanya there. And finally the Kirtan continued, and it went on and on and on, and it went on for three months. <laughs> three months. No one did anything but chant and dance. They became so empowered by the holy name that they were doing the most... Have you ever been to a kirtan where it's just like high energy and everybody's ecstatic? You never know what's going to happen next. You know, somebody will, you know, fall on the ground, do a backflip, somebody will die, somebody will knock somebody over. Well, people used to, we used to do all kinds of crazy things. All these sannyasis would be like a whole bunch of, they all throw their dundas up in the air at the same time. <laughs> and they start fighting with dundas. And it's just like, it's just like, kirtan, you never know where it's going to go when it's ecstatic. It's just mad. So this, this mad kirtan, they started dancing with trees. They were uprooting trees and dancing with the trees, small trees. But some of the big trees, they were walking up the side of the tree, going out on the branch and going to the end of the branch and dancing on the twig. And the twig was not breaking. And the boys were dancing in ecstasy on the end of the branches. And some of them, in their madness of kirtan, would dive off and yell out the names of the monkey soldiers in Ram's army. I am Angara. I am Sugriva 
and it was just mad, mad cure. So this went on for three months, and some of the villagers started to feel the energy of the holy name, and they started to come, and then the children of the villages. And it says that they also danced for one month. Unless Lord Nityananda's kirtan. <laughs> well, that just shows you, this is Vrindavan Das Thakur explains this in Chaitanya Bhagavad. He gives a narration of this particular. Oh, Mangala Devi, Haribo, welcome, welcome, welcome. And that's Nitai Nataraj. His name is Nitai Nataraj because you watch him, he just dances and dances and dances. We were just talking. He is the best dancer in Chicago. <laughs> okay. Mangala Devi, come sit up here. Oh, we got some Chicago eyes too here. Over down Leela, welcome. Thank you for coming. TK? <laughs> she doesn't speak English. <laughs> Tota? Tota, Tota. Tota? Tota, okay. Thank you. So, this is Lord Nityananda's kirtan. It just goes on and on. So we can pray to Lord Nityananda, please invest me with some of your transcendental energy so I can become inspired to dance and chant in the holy names of the Lord. Because when you're in kirtan, there is no other world. That's if we're absorbed in the holy name. So just like when we chant japa, the mind wanders. And then when the mind wanders, although the mantra is still going on, we're not really getting the benefit of the mantra because we're not listening closely to the sound. We're getting something, but because we're not hearing nicely, we're missing the ecstasy of chanting. So the same with kirtan. One has to very carefully absorb oneself in that sound and express that sound from the heart. It's called kirtan yagya. It's a yagya. So yagya means a sacrifice. What is the two aspects of sacrifice? Is the sacrifice of hearing and the sacrifice of chanting. So in order to perform the sacrifice properly, one has to simply absorb themselves in the sound. And you can hear the external part of the sound, where the sound of the holy names is there within the atmosphere. But if you really tune in to the sound, you go deeper into the mood of the chanter, and you can taste the bhakti that the chanter is offering. And then you start to go deeper into your own chanting. So that's a process of applying the principle of hearing in the most, what we say, complete way, in order to get the essence of that. And then the expression is comparable to the hearing sound. And the expression will be in the same mellow of the, in the sound of hearing. So it's all based on hearing. But one is, fo one is feeding the other as it goes on. Hearing, chanting, hearing, chanting. So we're putting the mind into the, into the sound of hearing and chanting the holy name. And it's like offering the ghee into the fire of the yagya. The yagya, the fire is the holy name. The ghee is our hearing and chanting. And the result is, you know, Krishna appears in the sound of his name. Therefore, it says that when kirtan is offensive, I'm sorry, offenseless, then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is personally present. And he showed that, he demonstrated that many times during kirtan. When kirtan, he descends into the kirtan and he dances along with the devotees. So this is the this is the jewel that the uh, that the great acharyas have handed us because they have captured that jewel from the Lord Himself. So this sankirtan movement is the highest spiritual benediction that we can possibly understand. 
And therefore, the scriptures only, the scriptures say one can only underestimate the glories of the Lord. It's not possible to overestimate, nor is it possible to even to estimate, but to speak of overestimating. So this is Sri Harinam Sankirtan. Any questions? Before I continue, I have some more, but I was thinking, I saw some eager faces here. Yes. Radha Vinodini. I read in Koto Vinda Maharaj's book uh, that uh, every ego had uh, a certain mantra called Taraka Brahmanam or Taraka Brahmanam, I don't know how to pronounce it. And every mantra has? Yes. Uh, every yuga have, have, has, uh, has uh, some certain mantra. And, uh, it yeah. and how it connects to, to that uh, I know that every, every yuga has a certain dharma. But uh, I don't know what this, this uh, name means, this Tarak Brahmanam, or, or what it is, because I searched on the internet, because in the book it wasn't uh, written. It's mentioned in the Dwarpura Yuga. It's, it's Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. That was the mantra for that age. I worship the Supreme Personality of Vasudev, who is situated everywhere. That's what Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya uh, is translated into. So that was the Maha Mantra in that age. But the Yuga Dharma was very costly and very, what we say, elaborate deity worship. People were very expert at performing deity worship. And what we have in terms of the deity worship is 20% of what they did. At best. I mean, the Brahmins were so qualified in chanting the mantras, and the de decorations of the deities were so gorgeous. Beautiful temples were built in Dwarka Yuga just to glorify the Lord. Some of them are still there. So, yeah, we can't compare to that type of worship in this age. But they also chanted Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, but it wasn't the Yuga Dharma. What was the function of that? Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't really catch this point. Uh, the function of the mantra? Yeah. Uh, Just like we perform deity worship to purify ourselves so we can do the chanting of the holy name. So they're performing the chanting of the, the holy name so they can purify themselves to do deity worship. <laughs> it's, it's supportive. But it's, just, it's the, what we say, the outstanding recommended form of mantras. And, so every age has a particular mantra, and every age has a, a Yuga Dharma, and every age has an incarnation of the Lord. All three of those appear in each age. Sri mm -hmm. Devi. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. In the lecture, uh, Your Holiness said, one can fulfill all one's desires through becoming self-realized. But when we become self-realized, we won't have any desires other than to please Krishna. We'll have, we'll have spiritual desires. So there's two ways to, two ways to fulfill the desire. One is to eliminate it, and two is to fulfill it. So to when you eliminate a desire, the desire is fulfilled. <laughs> So it eliminates all material desires and fulfills all our spiritual desires. But no one can be desireless. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. The soul is full of desires, but those desires are all in relationship to their, their service to Krishna. How to serve Krishna, what mood to serve Krishna in, what association to serve Krishna in. Um, in other words, mm -hmm. It's called Pranasiddha Pranali. One's spiritual identity and the execution of one's service in that pure spiritual identity. It's still full of desires, but it's all in relationship to pure bhakti, to for Krishna. When you study, you know, 
Ananda Vrindavan Chapel by Kavi Kanapur and Rupa Goswami Ujwala Nilamani. These all describe what are the spiritual desires of the pure living entities. So everyone has this, you can't stop desire. You just have to. Material desires are a perverted reflection of our spiritual desires. Because we're not trying to fulfill material desires, spiritual desires, we're in association with Krishna's external energy. Because we're in association with this external energy, we create desires based on the interaction of that energy. The principle of the ananda, or happiness, exists within the soul. And it's manifested in this material world as trying to enjoy various types of sense gratification. In the form of, you know, material acquisitions or just plain sensual stimulation. But it's all a reflection of the reality. It's not the reality because this material body is not us. It's just something that's given to us because we've come to this material world. So, so these, all these material desires become purified and nullified through the process of bhakti. So that's what it means to fulfill all these all desires perfectly and completely. So what, is, what are the desires that we have? The ultimate desire is love. We're trying to find love in this world. So we create different relationships with different types of living entities in this world and try to, wait to find some fulfillment in that relationship. But there's no perfect relationship in this world. It's not possible. It's not possible because it's based on something that is artificial, the body. It's based on something that is the body. But on the spiritual level, two people can have a perfect relationship when they work together to serve Krishna and they serve each other in serving Krishna. That's all. Then that's perfection within the material world based on our relationship with Krishna. You follow? Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm also wondering, Guru Maharaj, if you can explain a little bit about how to distinguish between really spiritual desires and material desires because they can masquerade as spiritual desires when actually they're very subtle. So you just check material. the instructions of this, your spiritual master and check the instructions of the scriptures. If they're not in line with these things, it's material. So it says eat, but eat prasada. <laughs> Sing and dance, but not in the discotheque. <laughs> Have sex, but for babies. <laughs> and to bring those babies up in spiritual life. Like that. So, yeah, these are all, what we say, activities of the body, but when they're connected to the process of devotional service, that means they're under the guidance of the spiritual master, that's spiritual. But if they're, if they're outside of that, or they're done in the wrong way, then the material energy enters in and, and makes, that even, makes it somewhat spiritual and somewhat material, or completely material. Just like we want to, just like I want to serve Krishna because I want to be happy. That's, that's a combination of material desire and spiritual activity. We serve Krishna because we want to please Krishna and happiness comes automatically. You don't have to try to make but But because we don't really understand the principle or have, don't have complete faith in the principle, we still are motivated by our own happiness in whatever activity we do. But that's, that's bhakti which is tinged with karma. And sometimes we want to be great and have some great knowledge or some, some philosophical understanding. So that's also a material desire because it's tinged with the desire to be learned, to be great, to be known as a spiritualist. So the subtleties of material, material desires can manifest in the form of Krishna, one's bhakti. That's why if you read... Um, Nectar Devotion, also Jaiva Dharma. These are books, and especially um, 
Manushiksha. Last year we did Manushiksha for this for the uh, for the disciples meeting. You can find that the finer forms of material contamination comes out in the form of different kinds of subtleties: the desire for fame, the desire for prestige, the desire for honor, the desire for position, the desire for pecuniary gains from devotional service. So one can perform devotional service in order to cre create, increase one's material desires, material happiness. But one cannot actually ma remain fixed in that because after a while one of the two will, will overcome. Either one will get purified and move away from that or one will continue to manifest these things and then devotional service will become less and less. It depends on your association. Thank you, Maharaj. Association has the foundation to move us one way or the other. Okay, anybody else? Any other questions? If I'm around? All the sadhus are on this side. Yeah. <laughs> the sad, all the sadhus. I know, all the men. You know everything, so you're not asking. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna, thank you for lecture. Um, I have a question regarding, um, we mentioned um, enthusiasm and japa. As opposed to routine. As opposed to routine. Um, and how it is... Mandla Devi, can you understand? She can translate for you. Yeah, sure. Good, sit over there. <laughs> She's from Orissa. That's Lord Chaitanya's personal family. <laughs> Um, for example, how um, we can, in the association of devotees, when we chant in the certain um, places, like with devotees, um, how to say, be, um, in being enthusiastic about chanting, um, when we uh, lose the taste that something happened, what's the reason why we lose the taste sometimes? Enthusiasm for chanting together. No, well, there's different reasons. One is the most obvious reason is offenses. Therefore, one should. That's why we recite, and I know you all do it here every day. You recite the ten offenses to the holy name as part of the morning program. That's not just just to fill in the little time period so we can go on to the next thing. It's good to meditate on those ten offenses. That's why Prabhupada introduced the ten offenses in the morning program and whenever he gave initiations, most of the time he always had the ten offenses recited. Because we don't know what these ten offenses are and how to avoid them. Or if we just have an idea, and we, because it requires some under explanation. Each of the offenses require explanation. So if we're committing the offenses, we can we won't get the taste for the holy name. It doesn't mean we should give up chanting. It just means we should try to get rid of the offenses and continue on with our chanting. Um, another thing is that if we're, the tenth offense to the holy name is to maintain material desires even after understanding so many instructions. So year after year, we're hearing the glories of the holy name, we're engaged in chanting the holy name, but we're still looking to the material world for satisfaction, for fulfillment. That will cause us to not to taste the nectar of the holy name. That's called the I, me, and my offense. What does that mean? I still think I'm this body, 
And I still think that I, by satisfying the senses of this body in a material way, I can be happy. So we're still, one is still looking towards the material world. One may have material desires, and that is not a disqualification to perform devotional service. When we try to fulfill material desires, then we, we were curtailing our, 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 uh, our progress in bhakti. We're slowing it down a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's two things, offenses and still looking towards the material world for happiness, satisfaction, success. One has to understand, that's why the Shastra is very... Sometimes you see in Prabhupada's lectures, he's always talking about the futility of material life. I mean, if you listen to Prabhupada regularly, every lecture, practically every... Why? He's reminding us, don't try to be happy here. Don't try to be happy here. Here's where your happiness is. You can't be happy here. It's just the way it is. It's just this, it's a material world. The material world is designed for us to, to suffer, and so this place is designed for suffering. And so, so we may have material desires, but we can fulfill those desires in a spiritual way by engaging in devotional service. And so, making friendships and developing loving relationships with the devotee satisfies the heart. We need that. We need to have loving relationships with other Vaishnavas. That's available through this process when we actually follow the etiquette of Vaishnava culture. Then we don't have to look outside to find friendship with the non devotees We may interact with them, but we find our heart becomes satisfied in the association of Vaishnavas. So that's a, that's a foundational principle that keeps us connected to the process of devotional service. If we don't develop loving relationships with other devotees, we will try to find it somewhere else. Because you need love. And it's not we can just love Krishna and forget everybody else. It's not possible. Krishna's, everything about this, about Krishna is manifested through his devotees. That's why the success of devotional service is really based on two principles, Vaishnava Seva and Sangha and Namruchi, those two things. Mahaprabhu emphasized that. <laughs> so, yeah. We can lose our enthusiasm if we're still looking outside for fulfillment. If we kept we should catch ourselves. Oh, that's Maya. That's Maya. Anything else? Sri Devi. Guru Maharaj, um, I personally have seen that um, in the course of chanting the holy names, well, certainly, definitely, um, I have matured. But I've also seen that life has gotten more and more and more difficult at some levels. So how does we are are we supposed to think that Krishna is putting one more test to draw us closer to him or we're doing something wrong and how to correct that in that case? Well, as you, if you're progressing in devotional service, you're developing the qualities and the intelligence to deal with all the challenges and apparent difficulties that come. And therefore, you're able to keep moving forward. But the difficulties will always be there until you become a pure devotee. Then, when you're a pure devotee, then you get a never had a difficulty. 
But the, it doesn't really matter at that point because those other kind of difficulties is people might criticize you for what you are. Or one of the pure devotees' difficulties. Sometimes they have to, you know, perform great austerities in order to perform their devotional service. But for us, what is the difficulty? Getting up in the morning? <laughs> Practice. And we're going to try this weekend to, what we say, fortify our chanting with some other things that I think will be helpful that you could add to your chanting, which will strengthen your, uh, we will, will open up a greater form of mercy. We want to get as much mercy as possible. <laughs> But never get discouraged. If you're, in, if you're in association of devotees, you can somehow weather the, the storms of the Maya's attacks. But when you're outside the association of devotees, or if you don't have association with devotees who are, who are fixed in Krishna consciousness, then it becomes difficult. Then it's just, then the mind sort of, sort of tries to rationalize and and tries to get out of the difficulties when the solution might be might be right before you, just by association of devotees. Uh, one of the example was Narayan Swami. He told me, you know, the well, we do we do counseling, so people come to the sannyasis. This happens all the time for some counseling, personal problems. That's part of the service. So he was telling me people were coming to him. As he preaches in the Ukraine, he preaches in Russia, up in that area. It's a lot of problems, people coming, problem, this problem, that problem. So he decided for one year, I'm going to give every class on chanting the holy names. That's all. That was going to be my topic in every class. So he did that for one year. He said after one year, 50% of the problems reduced. Our problem is we're not tasting the chanting of the whole name. Therefore, we have so many problems. <coughs> as soon as we develop a taste, that sweet taste, ruchi, um, the problems are still there, but they're incidental. They're just like little inconveniences. That's all. Prabhupada said, bring in the light, darkness goes. <laughs> We're emphasizing the positive. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. Sure, of the incident you're referring to. <coughs> Prabhupada, according to your understanding, Prabhupada said, do either one, Kirtan or Japa? No, he, Prabhupada understands it's absolute. <laughs> it's, what is it? It's chanting the holy names of the Lord. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did both. 
He also turned it up every day in front of Tulsi. And so, for one who's fixed in chanting, you look forward to both. Don't answer this question, but how many of you really look forward to your japa? Think about it. I mean, we all look forward to kirtan, right? But how many do you actually think, or you think, ah, 16 rounds, I gotta start from zero again today. That's because we're not approaching the Holy Name in the right way. Mm -hmm. Approach the Holy Name in the right way, it's, it's a whole different experience. We have to be humble, we have to be eager, we have to be prayerful, and we have to be determined, despite whatever the mind wants to do. Yeah, so it's absolute. In this statement by Ayendra, he said, Japa's like tablets and Kirtan's like injection. <laughs> One, both of them are giving us the medicine. forward to chanting our japa as we look forward to kirtans too. <coughs> Kirtan seems to be easier because everyone is together and the room is filled. But at the same time, when you're in japa, it's just you and Krishna. And it's nice. It's very personal job. We should not be overwhelmed with the difficulties that come in chanting. Because the tendency in Kali Yuga and the tendency in the conditioned souls is to see success based on what you can do. You can't see any results in Japa. I'm spending two hours, but what did I get done? But if I finish my rounds, then I can do this, I can do that, I can do this, I can do that. And then at the end of the day, we look at oh, what everything we did. But what about purification of the heart? That's what comes with the sadhana. The japas is that sadhana that's going to purify us. Which makes the rest of the day, what we say, fulfilling. When you're happy, chant. When you're unhappy, chant. When you're in between, chant. Chant. The uh, Vishwara Chakravarti Thakur says, by chanting every day, one will chant always. So, what is he saying every day? That means every day do kirtan, every day do japa. Gradually, 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 purifying the heart, we'll you develop a taste and want to chant more and more. We want that. We want to just chant, chant, chant. Even if you're worshiping the deity. You can't worship the deity unless you're chanting the holy names. There was one pujari. It was in Golokadam. This was many years ago, when the president of Goloka Dham came to me, and I was visiting there. This was back in the early part of the century. He said, Ma, Ma, Maharaj, I have this Pujari. She's really the best. She does deity worship so nicely. She's always punctual. She's always thinking how to create nicer ways to, to worship the deity, decorations, dressing but she doesn't chant rounds. 
And she's, when I try to encourage her, she says there's nine crosses of bhakti, and Archanam is one of them. <laughs> so, you know, Kirtanam, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smaranam, Parasavidam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmani, Vedanam. Nine ways of bhakti, and it says that each of the limbs of bhakti can be perfected for one's devotional success. In other words, one can become perfect. But the thing is, the, the acharyas give us a, the understanding that in this age, the other eight processes must be accompanied by the chanting of Hare Krishna. That's in the Shastras. That's spoken by Srila Prabhupada. So I mentioned to the president, I said, you know, you have to encourage her that, you know, you know, to chant the holy name because it is the Yuga Dharma. But I said, don't try to push her out, let her continue with her service, but always encourage her to chant. And I said, if she doesn't, she'll eventually lose her enthusiasm for her service. Because Krishna, in the form of the deity, will kick her off the altar. <laughs> You, you want to serve me in this way, but you're not serving my pure devotee who's telling you to chant the holy names. You can't serve me unless you serve my pure devotee. It's not possible. You're disobeying instructions of my pure devotee and his representatives also, and you want to approach me? Krishna says, I'm out of here. <laughs> so, I, and that's what happened. And later, about a month later, I spoke to him again. He said, I said, what happened? She left. Did you, did you? No, I said, he, I didn't do anything. I just let her continue. And she left on her own. Yeah, so that's why if we don't chant the holy names of the Lord, and we perform other services, we won't be able to remain enthusiastic or fixed in those other services. Everything depends on the Lord. You know, remember the president of Golokadam? His name was Golokadam. <laughs> you remember him? Yeah, he he left his body actually. He's the one I was telling. He was such a nice devotee. He was like a jewel, that boy. It's an unfortunate accident he had, a car accident. But you know. So this is, this is one example of many the people who don't chant the holy names and try to serve. Because their service is about them, it's not about Krishna. How do you know if your service is about you or Krishna when it gets difficult? And you can't see any reason why you should do it and you do it anyway, then it's for Krishna. That is for Krishna. And Krishna will put you in that situation just for that purification. And then when you just, all right, Krishna wants me to do it. It's the instructions of my spiritual master. I'm not inclined, I can't, I feel it's too hard, whatever reason the mind is coming up with. And if you do it, then you're actually making a sacrifice. That's yagya. That's yagya. Because the, the difficulties in bhakti are the means to make fast advancement. When everything is easy, we can make advancement. But when you accept difficulties and you work through them, and you stay steady in your service in the right consciousness, then you actually make progress. Because something, some, some anartha, some, what we say, consciousness that shouldn't be there is causing you to feel like that. And if you push through that, then you're, you're destroying that in Artha. You're destroying that negative consciousness. Because devotional service is, what we say, it's right or running. It's perfect. Any other questions? Yes, 
this room and maybe not in London. We want to end soon because tomorrow is a full day. Hare Krishna. Guru Maharaj, can uh, in the same time exist faith in the holy name and inattentive chanting? Or if chanting is inattentive, this is not faith? Any kind of chanting is, causes us to commit offenses. It's an offense in itself and it causes us. So whatever faith we have, we're, 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 we're watering down that faith. Because faith is supported by knowledge, faith is supported by experience. Faith is supported by association. So your faith may be strong, but if you continue to chant inattentive, then you'll actually start to lose your enthusiasm for chanting. Or you find yourself in a pattern that you can't get out of. Inattention can create a pattern that is very difficult to break. Devotees who chant long-term inattentively can't sometimes will either give up their chanting or remain in a very neophyte position, just going through the motions of chanting. So when you see that there's some inattention there, then you want, one should take the remedy. One should not allow inattention to continue. Because it could, it could cause us to become less Faithful. That faith, that lessening of faith will cause us to lose enthusiasm for association, for service, like that. It'll happen all, just naturally. Because attentive chanting will bring us more enthusiasm, and attentive chanting will dampen our enthusiasm. So for a while you can go on, but not for a long while. After a while it's, it becomes dangerous. I knew one devotee, he was helping other devotees become attentive. And he was telling me, I'm working with people who have been chanting inattentive for 20 years. And it's so hard to break their patterns. Because you fall into a pattern of inattention. That's why now, we're, especially Sachi Nandana Maharaj is coming up with different, what we say, ways to help us break that inattention that we can add to our chanting of the holy names. Like that, the Shastras also mention different things. So yeah, shouldn't allow it to go on. Bhaktivedanta Thakur explains in Jaiva Dharma how important it is to overcome this inattention. It's uh, by chanting inattentively, we have a tendency to commit the other ten offenses. When you chant attentively, the other ten offenses, you reduce the tendency to commit offenses. That's how it works. Attentive chanting reduces other offenses. Inattentive chanting causes us to commit other offenses. Hmm. Because when you're chanting tenderly, you're getting the, the nectar of Krishna's name. So you have to practice that. So Bhakti Vinota, of course, said, if you want to make significant progress, and devotional service, and if you don't know where to put your energy, put it here. Put it here. Put it here on a ten of chanting. And then he says your endeavors will bring great fruit. And the ten of chanting, we'll, we'll speak about that in the whole class, it's called pramada. <laughs> what, is, what is mada? Mada means madness. Pramanda means crazy, and Umanda means complete craziness.
Prabhupada describes, Oh Mother is like a person takes off all her clothes and runs outside screaming. That's Oh Mother. <laughs> so one level lower than that is Pramada. That's in the tent of chanting. <laughs> we'll get into that because as soon as I start, we might not stop. <laughs> so, but try to work on your uh, attentive chanting. That's very important. Okay. Thank you very much. Shiva Prabhupada Ki Shiva Bhagavatam Ki so those who are not familiar, Mangalarti is at five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs>